Today's show is brought to you by Maitland & Co. Solicitors and Notaries. Now, of course, we hope that you never need to avail yourselves of legal services, but unfortunately, life isn't like that. And Maitland & Co. are specialists in criminal defence and road traffic law, and they come highly recommended from heart and hand. They cover all over Scotland, and they deal with all types of criminal cases, including road traffic law. They appear in Justice of the Peace, Sheriff and High Courts. They are on call 24-7, because... Because unfortunately you're never going to know when you're going to need a lawyer and they are available 24-7 for police station interviews, prison visits, legal aid is available, competitive rates if applicant is not eligible for legal aid and first interview is free. Maitland & Co. have represented fans charged under the offensive behaviour at football legislation. So, if you ever need legal counsel, the best place to go is Maitland & Co. Get in touch with them at info at maitlandandco.net. That's info at maitland, M-A-I-T-L-A-N-D and co.net. 07714 That's info at maitlandandco.net 07714-615-845 for all your criminal defence needs. Hello everybody and welcome to Heart and Hand Extra. My name's David Edgar, I'm your host and I'm joined this week by Adam Thornton. Hello Adam. Hello David, how are you doing? Fine, calm down after Sunday yet? Yeah, I think I've got uh, I've got all the tension out with the, the pod this week. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm willing to move past it. Three days, four days on, sorry, maybe five actually by the time people come to listen to this. Uh, what are your thoughts, as I say now, that the the fuzziness is cleared for the head and the initial disappointment, annoyance and anger and everything? What you do, the tactic show on the Heart and Hand Patreon site, what, what was your take on it? My take on it was there was a combination of really, really poor uh, defensive decisions by us and, and the, the three goals. <laughs> Um, born a little bit out of the formation, but but also I think there's no denying that Rogers played more of an impact in uh, the result than than Murray did. Um, for me, I think he changed it. Not with the sending off, although I think the sending off probably galvanised them. But I think he changed it by bringing on Edward and going right down the middle. Uh, that killed us really, and, and Murray didn't react. Um, just threw Cummings on, didn't change it. So many different options. We spoke about them this week in the WhatsApp group to were blowing the face. There's Combinations he could have done to try and stem the flow and try and get back in the game, and and, and it never quite happened. So it has to go down as a as a black mark, but I, I, I don't think it's a it's not a total knockout for me. I think there's still enough. We've seen enough, um, and we like you said. I think on one of the pods we are a lot closer than we really thought we would be uh, at Christmas. So as much as it's a pain in the fucking arse that we're a width of post away from a, a decent result, we're, we're not far away and we are making progress, um, although you might not know it, uh, given the, the reaction we've had in some places. Yeah, I think, as I say, it was it was disappointment as well, and that, that almost multiplied the anger because I think that we felt we had a good chance. And we weren't wrong. That's the annoying thing. You know, we went into that game and two each at half time and we were disappointed to be two each at half time and then obviously a red card and we should have won that game but this was the thing that I think um, there's maybe the the feeling of oh damn you know I believed again and, and we've lost again but it didn't make the belief wrong we were right to be confident going into that match it is a change from earlier in the season when we were going in you know with hope but it was just that, it wasn't based on anything we were right to go into that match thinking that we would do something and the fact that we didn't uh, doesn't change the fact we were right to think that we could and should have so that leads us then on of course to, you know, we've had I think a fairly quiet week in terms of stuff in and around the club, the the main news would be Daniel Kandias has signed a new deal Um, I'm a fan and I think that he has had a good season. I don't think he's a, a great player. I think he's you know, uh, somebody that, that you're maybe going to be singing his name in, in 10 years or anything. But I think he's a really solid, dependable, hard-working player. Who, his crossing is erratic, but it comes back to if his crossing was more consistent, he wouldn't be playing in Scotland. And I think overall that the improvement in him and the improvement in your hero, Tav, um, because he's got that settled partner in front of him that, that they trust each other and they have a good understanding. I, I was quite happy with this announcement, Adam. Yeah, uh, I agree. <clears throat> he's the best creator in the league, as, as we know. I think it's two 
two clear cut chances per game. He's maybe a little higher than that now, actually, I think, on average. But I think your point is right. And any you put him in another Rangers team, and he probably wouldn't. It may not work. However, it just seems to be one of these situations where the component parts, i.e., him and Tav, or his relationship with Windass, or, or whatever it is that you put him in this team to do a specific role, and it's just absolutely made for him. Um, and he's he's playing really, really well, and he's. Yeah, he's he's been one of our best players this year. Um, maybe if you go consistency wise, maybe the best player um, overall. Um, there's players who have been better, but I would say in terms of hitting the seven or eight out of tens uh, more often than not, I think he, he's up there. Yeah, it's a it's a good uh, a good extension for me. I think that what is telling there, and that's a good point about guys who are helping to bring out the best in other players. I think you see that on the other on the other flank where. Kilmarnock is an interesting point because the last time we played Kilmarnock was one of the poorest performances of the season at Rugby Park. Uh, it, it, we were awful. And yes, it took two late goals from Kilmarnock, one just a real, uh, you know, poachers goal from Chris Boyd for them to, to win the match. But we couldn't complain. We I thought we were second best from kickoff to, to the final whistle. And that day in particular, I thought that Declan John had a right nightmare of a game. He scored, but he had a very poor match. And the guy who was playing up to Christmas, I don't think has bore much resemblance to the guy who's played after uh, after the winter break. And a large part of that is, yes, Declan John's improvement. He has worked hard and he deserves credit. But I think he would have to be honest and say having Jamie Murphy there has been a huge benefit to him. I agree. Um, <clears throat> he... I've not been a huge fan, uh, if I'm honest. I, I know he's been quite dependable, and even before Christmas, people were, were, were kind of saying, yeah, he's a good player and stuff. I've not been a, a great believer in him, but I think we've seen we've seen a difference in Tav from last year to, to this year, having having someone there consistent. And I think uh, it's yet another positive for Murphy, bringing out the best in John. And I think the way that you can tell a player's going to make it, I think for us, is, is that the last two old firm games John has been solid as a rock he's not let Forrest get anywhere really near him um, defensively he's never going to be great but it's the attacking side of it that he brings it's always the thing I've always said about Tav and I, I got a bit of stick before was not that I don't care if you if you throw in the odd goal but when, when you multiply it so well with your offensive output I'm willing to forgive it um, I've not seen John make that many mistakes post Christmas so yeah and I think a lot of that is down to Murphy like you said playing as a unit um, and also let's not forget that <coughs> Scott wrote Murphy, Murphy off after three games so this I is another positive so, yeah. first yeah, three another games. positive first on, on that one yeah three three games I think it was before Scott said Jamie Murphy was shite um, yeah I'd never let him forget Rangers would he right. be that's why he's not here anymore <laughs> yes among, among other reasons uh, Rangers would be in a uh, fuck it, I'll say it. Rangers would be pushing for the title if it wasn't for our home form at Ibrox. Discuss. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I thought it was. I, I think it, this might sound a bit stupid, given given that we've just been beaten. But I, I think the issues that we had pre Christmas are different to the issues that we have post Christmas. Uh, Murphy is now sorry. Murphy has now beaten the teams that sit in against us um, at Ibrox. He, he's had a few occasions like that. He's had a few away games where the teams have sat in even more and he's, he's cracked them, like Fraserburgh, um, St. Johnson, a couple other ones. So I think that issue is now resolved. It's just the same outcome, if you like. Hibs and Celtic coming is a different challenge to the Comarnocks, etc., that we struggled pre-Christmas. Uh, so I think that's been resolved. It's just been... 180. Not freak results. Aye, not freak results, but that, that's a bit unfair. But just those two games have been a complete 180, as you say, on, on the, the games that we had pre-Christmas. Now, Kilmarnock, obviously, that's the, the, the game that we've got coming up and uh, I think a really attractive fixture. Uh, now, of course, we're not neutrals, but for anyone who would be, then this is two teams who've been playing well, Rangers performance or result last week notwithstanding. Two sides that have been playing really well. Kilmarnock, I think, have caught a lot of people's eye uh, this season with their displays under Steve Clark. I and mean, when you think where they were at the start of the season to where they are now, uh, they've had a remarkable turnaround and I believe that the defeat the other night which of course was after extra time uh, well actually it was after penalties I believe that they, they, they stopped a, a fairly decent run and they've been on 
Uh, I think that they've taken something like 33 points out of a possible 45, which is is excellent for Kilmarnock. And they will come to Ibrox with a game plan. Now, that's not to say that they will, you know, with 10 men behind a ball. I don't believe that. But nor will they be ill-disciplined. Clark is a good tactician. He will have them working to a system. And it will be a challenge for Rangers because it won't be, as I say, I think 10 men behind the ball and just defend for your life. But nor will it be a case of them coming out and saying, right, we'll go toe-to-toe and if you win, it's because you're better than us. I think that we'll have a really interesting challenge on Saturday against a side who are... uh, Now, we can talk about whether we're this or not, but sometimes there's a club who, if you like, are, are managed to a position higher than the talent at the club would suggest they can get to. And that's obviously the dream thing when you have a manager is that somebody who can take what you've got and actually turn out better than you could maybe hope for. And if you look at what Kilmarnock have done under Clark in terms of budget, in terms of their squad, because you look at their squad, it's not exactly overflowing with quality players. They have a few, but it's not it's not packed out. Um, this will be a tough challenge against a side who, because of the nous of their manager, are able to consistently overperform to to what you would expect. I think that <clears throat> I think that's key. Yeah, he's got them playing. They are a they are a defensive side. I don't think I don't think it's, it's doing a disservice to them, but they're not a like you said, ten men against the ten men behind the ball and kick it the way you're facing side. They 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 are quite smart on the, on the counter attack. They've obviously got Jones, who I know we're we're linked with, um, who who's a, a decent weapon uh, for them. Boyd is. Back to what he was ten years ago, I think he's he's now top scorer if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think he's got one more than Morelos, so we do have a threat. Uh, they've also got um, a player I quite like. I've seen a couple of times now is Eamon Brophy, um, who's I think he's 21, 22 that they got from Hamilton last summer. He outside of uh, Celtic is actually he's fourth for expected goals per ninety minutes just now. He's getting zero point six six expected goals per ninety minutes, which is crazy for someone like Kamarnock. He's not really been a first pick there but he's someone definitely to watch out for he can hurt us and obviously we've seen uh, pre-Christmas Malumbu absolutely battered Holt and McCrory so that's something to watch as well now he's back from, from injury That will be interesting because we've obviously got different midfielders in there and different types of midfielders in there now um, it'll be interesting to see the battle one of the things I love most about having you on here Adam is you know you're a stats guy and you're someone who's really into the tactical side of football and just to complete the cliche you cannot start a sentence without having to clear your throat because your voice um, goes all high <laughs> I've actually got a cold, but fuck you. Uh, well, you know, the, 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 you seem to have had a cold for the last, what, 10 years. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> moving on. Uh, what was it you said before we came on air tonight? Uh, quite a lot of things. I'm not sure we can broadcast them, though. No, but the one that I think the listeners should, should know about, as I said to Adam, there's a lot of background noise here. Are you moving about? He said, I'm just trying to get my cushions sorted. Aye, what's wrong with that? I want to be comfy when I'm talking about Rangers, surely. It's just the most heart and hand comment imaginable. Even Scott, I don't recall sitting saying, you know what, cushions, I need to, you know, it's just not a male thing to be in any way. I'm sitting here in a chair out of any cushions. You know why? Because I'm a man. Okay, maybe one day I'll get to that level. Yeah, well, if, if anyone has some cushion abuse for Adam, he's at, at Adamski152 on Twitter. Um, <laughs> so you can send him in some, some abuse that way. Like I say, I've been impressed with Kelly this season. I, I think anyone who hasn't is uh, wrong, really, because the turnaround in a side that I fully admitted to be in a, a, a relegation battle, uh, good signings, and, and like I say, getting more out of players than than you would have thought that they had that they had to offer. I don't expect to see a significant amount of changes to the side. Now, obviously, David Bates will be missing. The latest we hear on him is that, obviously, it wasn't a broken ankle, but it'll be a minimum of kind of three weeks out with him. Um, and the, the, the still worryingly, they're saying that they, he's still getting scans. And um, I wonder if that initial three-week prognosis might end up being a wee bit ambitious. So let's let's just go through the, the, the questions. And tactically, I don't see any change. First of all, I don't see the system changing. Am I being hopelessly naive there, or will Marty stick to what has worked for him in the main? I think this system is, is for now, or should be for now, the default system when you're playing at home 
um, certainly against teams that are going to sit in a little bit. Um, I think it's got everything you need offensively. I think Goss and um, Doherty are fine. I'm expecting Doherty to give Malumbu uh, a bit more trouble than, than Holt did, who just seemed to bounce off him like a wee boy. Um, so I'm expecting that. Um, if you're asking me in an ideal world, going into a game like this after we've just lost against Celtic and we're playing a team like you said that's on a great run, I'm maybe not playing this system. I'm maybe looking at playing uh, Dorans or even McCrory alongside Goss and Dockery. We don't have that luxury at the moment. So I think we've been making points all week. Alex has mentioned if if the only other option is is Holt and Hardy. I don't feel like throwing them into this is is really the right approach. So yeah, I'm expecting expecting the same team um, as Saturday, uh, Sunday, sorry, minus uh, Bates. Will it be Cardoso or is Martin liable to, to pop back in and if so is he fit oh I would be playing Martin unless he was really <laughs> unless he was desperately injured I would be playing Martin I think I, I actually came out of the game and I said to you my initial reaction on, on Sunday was I thought Cardoso was okay certainly not the case after I watched it back no. so um, I would be hoping it's uh, I'll be I think the, the strange thing about Cardoso is, is I think he is a better player for some reason when Alves isn't there and we spoke about this earlier in the season about whether or not it's a psychological thing because there's no reason for him to to do a, a much significantly different performance when Alves isn't there this isn't a criticism of Alves incidentally I just wonder if he holds him in such high esteem that he's almost yeah. in awe of him and we saw it even on Sunday he follows him about like a puppy and he doesn't play I think his natural game, which well, I'm not going to sit here and try and kid anybody on that Fabio Cardoso is you know, the, the the next version of Richard Goff. He's not. The, there are gaping holes in his game, but he's not as bad as he was on Sunday. Now, against that, it's a hell of a game to get chucked into. He hadn't played much football. And we do need to take that into account, as disappointing as it is. And the fact that I think a lot of people have written him off already. But, but he is, let's be honest, he's the fourth or fifth choice centre-back. So um, I understand why, why people do. But I, I just think when he plays with Alves, he sort of plays, like I say, like a starstruck Wayne. And it, it it's telling to me that when Alves hasn't been there, he's tended to kind of step up and almost become more of a... Cause, there's no reason for him to be as physically timid as he looks. He's a big guy, he's strong, and I, I just don't think he shows it for some reason when Alves is there. You know, he just totally reminds me of Carl Svensson. Um, just that kind of makeup of a player, just scared to head the ball, always lets it bounce, just looks fucking terrified um, every time the ball comes near him, and it just kind of withdraws into himself he can kind of tell he has had some good games that's that's it's unfair for me to say that he's he's not he has played quite well never with Alves yeah you're right it maybe has something to do with playing alongside your your hero or something you're, you're doubly on edge at, at fucking up and you end up shit in the bed um, and which has happened yeah. so often and like I say when I watch the game back we suffer for our art here on heart and hand folks we we, we do actually uh, watch the games back regardless of result or performance and yeah he had a noticeably poor game uh, as you said at the time I thought I thought he hadn't been great but I didn't think he'd been as bad but when I saw him he was, he was all over the place um, positionally weak physically weak uh, as you see letting the ball bounce just making simple errors that that you shouldn't you know there, there, there are things that an opposition team especially a good opposition team can do against you but he was he was creating a lot of his own issues uh, and that worried me now one of the things about Kilmarnock is is that you know with Boyd if he's their, their striker and I assume he will be you'll get the physical battle but there shouldn't be the worry about pace no, which which is something that that will be good because Alves, I think we've seen Alves was was terrified of of Mbele's pace and, and Eduardo when he came on. I think both of them are, so we'll see that sitting back. Just your your point there about the individual errors, and I, I know we're going to I'm going to go back to the, the game on Sunday again, but I, I mentioned it on the tactics show. Um, the third goal, watching it back, is just one of the worst goals I've seen as conceded ever. I think. Um, I touched on it, so I'll just I'll, I'll run through it here briefly. But there was actually unbelievably six points of failure in in the build up to their goal. I seen the goal and I didn't really make, at the game. I was just like, all right, okay, yeah, he's done well. He's, it's, a, it's a brilliant finish. It is a good finish, but six times we we, we could and should have took the ball off someone. Um, there's a loose ball in the middle. Doherty heads it kind of aimlessly up the field. Um, Goss misses it. 
Brown gets it to McGregor, who and Windass just doesn't make an effort at all in the, the, the centre circle to, to challenge the ball. Goes to Dumbelli, finds its way back out again. Goss misses it again. Then it gets to Edward. Then it's in the box. And then, like you've seen, Edo eight Goss and Cardoso, I think it is, just gets sent an absolute dummy by Edward. And Tav's caught up the park as well. It's not even that good a dummy. It's not like an outrageous piece of skill. You know what he's going to do. Um, we, we're yes, not you, we're not seeing a Michael Moles esque turn here. He just turns inside, and they all go, yes. "Oh right." It's so basic, and and as much as it pains me, the the, the main culprit, and not a culprit is is the wrong word, but but Tav was wildly out of position. If you watch it back, he is up doing what he, doing what he does, trying to nick the ball just over the halfway line and get the attacks going, just taking a risk to try and nick the ball. Those passes I mentioned are missed, etc. The ball gets into Tav's position, that drags Goss out. Goss was horrific in that three times he failed in the same move. Um, and like you said, just a quick shimmy, not even anything ridiculously technical. And then a great finish, obviously. But it was so galling watching it back because that just let the air out the whole thing. And it was never coming back, really, um, for me. Goss... I think you you touched on this earlier, but I'll mention this. Goss has had a lot of criticism this week because he was very poor. And uh, the poorest he's been for us, absolutely. But the options to replace him currently... Now, Graham Dorans is back in, in and around the squad. I don't know if Saturday will maybe come a little too early for him. He's a great option to have. But I think Goss needs to have a good game on Saturday to try and win back some of the faith of the support because... I have the slight worry, and it's not his fault, it's based on something that we saw previously, which was Emerson Hindman, who went off like a train and looked like a top-class player, and then petered out into to nothing. And because of that, because that's, that example is still fresh in the mind, then I, I think that, unfortunately for Goss, that's a comparison quite a few fans are wary of. But when you look at the the other options, we'll drop Goss and we'll play Holt or Halliday. No, at the moment I would prefer to see if Goss can rekindle what he has shown previously. Um, and I think he does need to get back on the horse, so to speak. I think it needs, it needs to be this game as well. That's that's two poor games in a row. Um, I, I think we had, and like you said, there is no other option. Um, he's maybe not... It's very rare to have a player like Goss playing in a, a, in a midfield two like that. Um, although against Hearts, he did it quite well. He managed to get his interceptions in and he was tackling everything that moved just a wee bit off the pace. There's no point of there's no point of reference with him or, 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 or a way you can look at his, his previous uh, previous clubs to see what he's done because he's only played. I think he's now played double the games for us that he's ever played in his entire career. So there's no way to know how he handles certain games, certain situations, etc. I think we just play him through it uh, and hope he doesn't fall off a cliff like, like Hyman did. I think the whole team kind of <laughs> fell off a cliff in that situation. So I'm, I'm hoping we get a bit more of a consistent run again of, of uh, games and he gets in the team. I still think, and I've been saying it for months, a, a three of Goss, McCrory and, and either Dockery or Dorans for me is, is um, crucial in certain games, like bigger games. I think we'll see more out of Goss there if he's got a bit more time on the ball and been shielded by other people. Um, it goes back to the whole thing we said about Warburton. At this moment in time, I have a funny feeling that Goss is having to do more things than he's capable of or, or should be doing um, due to the, the formation that we're playing. Mm, um, as as we, we've seen with Malumbo, who has been injured, um, but as we've seen with Malumbo, he, he presents a different type of challenge to pretty much any midfielder, I would say. Um, maybe in Cham, maybe in Cham actually, in terms of that physicality, but um, he's a different type of player. And he's already shown he can boss our Rangers midfield. This is a different Rangers midfield and one that certainly in terms of physicality you'd hope that Greg Doherty brings that extra bit. Yeah. Um but we, we can't allow ourselves to be bullied and maybe that is just the concern about Goss is that he was bullied last week and uh, he just could not get his game going at all. And to be to be honest, by the time he was substituted again, having watched the game back, he wanted to go off. You could see he was the 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 couple of minutes he'd had before it was a guy who was at the end of his uh, at the end of his his kind of rope, and uh, when he went off, I think that there wasn't an awful lot of 
um, complaint in the stadium. Um, despite you know afterwards, I thought, well, maybe we could have kept him on because he's a passer. But having watched the back, uh, but you know he would have been a passenger uh, in that game. Now the other selection dilemma, obviously, will be in the striking positions where. Alfredo Morelos has come in for an awful lot of criticism this week. Some fair, some not. And the problem that I think he has is that's been two really bad games. And I worry about Morelos' uh, body language when things aren't going well. And you can't read too much into body language, I know that. But he is a guy who uh, appears to let misses prey on him sometimes because, you know, at he goes and gets two goals after after missing that, that chant under the bar. But um, there, there have been a lot of voices calling for Cummings to get a game. I can't say I'm entirely against it, but equally I do understand the value of Alfredo Morelos to the side. I think he is a good player and, and missing... Uh, chances occasionally doesn't take away from the rest of his game but there is a temptation with a guy like Cummings who you know is very confident as an individual and who is a a naturally good finisher doesn't have I think as wide a skill set as Morelos but does in fact have the ability to, to to put the ball in the back of the net quite consistently the worry for me is that I don't know if there's a good way around this situation other than Morelos plays and, and does well and scores goals because if Morelos plays and is a bad game, the fans are going to be on him. That's just a fact. There's a guy waiting in the wings. It's not like when Alfie had his bad spell earlier this season in, t- in front of goal that there was nothing there that you could go, well, OK, let's drop him and play X. Um, now that that Cummings is there, it's almost like the fans have got someone that we can point to and say, well, he should be on. So if he he, he plays, but then equally, if you drop him, and he, you know, what does that do to his confidence? What does that do to him long term? I suppose that the third option is, well, you play both of them and you drop Windass, but I, I don't even know if that's worth talking about because that's not going to happen. Graham Murray, I don't think, is somebody who wants to drop... Uh, Josh Windass anyway the fact that he scored last week and created the chance that should have been the equaliser um, to me I think he sees him as a pivotal part of his side and I just don't see that option being exercised No I, I, I agree I don't, he's, he's not dropping him just now but I want to be kind and say he's not dropping him at the moment while we're so threadbare uh, in the central midfield or the deeper line midfield positions I think he sees that as his as his strongest four until he gets the time to, gets the time to try out other things I'm, I'm hoping that's the case because we need to have more options than than we have um, your point about Cummings and Morelos both I think for me um, again with, with a formation change perhaps both, both can both can work I am going to stick my neck on the line and say I don't think I would play Cummings as the sole striker in this formation at all, not not necessarily at all but but, but consistently um, I think we need a bit more physicality up there uh, to occupy defenders, we've seen the way that Morelos ragdolled them, I don't think Cummings would have done that um, on, on, uh, on Sunday, sorry I don't think Cummings has got that in his game so while we're playing this way um, I think it has to be Morelos and, and your point about uh, he's going to, the fans are going to get on his back etc um, maybe uh, but they didn't pre-Christmas and I appreciate that's because there was no competition but I think the mentality and character they showed to come back from that I mean that 10, that 10 games whatever it was would have broken some players um, to, to come back from that um, we know we can do it and, and I would I would just play them through it um, I, I think the benefit of Morelos potentially outweighs the benefit of Cummings Um if it wasn't Marnock who are on a bit of a high, I'd maybe look at giving Murphy a little bit of a rest again to try and fully recover from his, his injury, given we've got the international break coming up and, and play Cummings off the left. I think based on what I've seen so far of him in a Ranger stop, that's my preferred position for him in this formation. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm at with that. But I think, like you said, when this is, is not going to be dropped, he's, he's going to play that position um, for now, hopefully. Kurt Broadfoot returns to Ibrox for the first time since the Ryan Jack 
incident in which he cheated to get a fellow pro sent off. I, I'm a great believer that ex-players returning to Ibrox should, under normal circumstances, be given a good reception. Uh, I'm going to suspend that rule for right now, and I hope that we give the uh, poached egg faced cunt abuse from start to finish. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of fall on a chain of mind on this sometimes. I think why give him the fucking credit of, of having his boom? We wouldn't even notice him, really, if that hadn't happened. He's, he's in irrelevance. I think he, he did well for us back then, but he's, yeah, just in irrelevance. But I think he'll get, he'll get a bad reception, obviously, because what, what he did was terrible. And you think that the whole Lafferty and McGrew thing 10 years ago where he got, Lafferty got absolutely hauled over the coals. Broadfoot's not done that much worse than that and uh, the reaction has been completely different. Um, it just shows you the, the double standards. But yeah, he'll get a bit of a bad reception um, and hopefully we give him a, a bad day as well. Yeah, well, that's that's the key thing is I hope whichever player he's up against just absolutely roasts him because there's certainly the opportunity to make him look like the, the cart horse he now is and uh, I hope the Rangers take that, take that fully. So, Adam, prediction time. Um, what do you reckon the score will be this Saturday? I'm not going to be as confident as Hoggy. Where the fuck did that prediction come from? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go three, three, one, three, one Rangers. I think we'll win two one. I think it'll be a tight game, and I think that we'll do enough. I think we'll win two one. I think it'll be a good game. I think it'll be a really entertaining game. But uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think it'll be. Um, um, I hope Hoggy's right. He's not normally a four 0 guy, um, but I hope he's right. But I'm, I'm going for two one. That's that's what I'll be sticking on uh, on my bet. Now, before we go today, uh, I was looking at uh, Mark's website on Follow Follow, and uh, an interesting topic of discussion came up, which was do you, people who say Celtic and Rangers rather than Rangers and Celtic when they're discussing the two teams, and I've always thought that it was a code in a way because you naturally, I think, say your team or the team that you have sympathy towards first. So for me, it's automatically your Rangers and Celtic. It's Rangers and everybody. Um, am I being hopelessly naive here? Because apparently the thing that brought it to people's attention was Graham Murray said Celtic and Rangers. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, hang on, you've got that in the wrong way. Is this uh, something that's common, uh, or am I just uh, again taking something that I thought was a rule that I might have made up? Um, yeah, I, I'm with you 100%. Uh, anytime I, it's Rangers and everybody else, anytime somebody says Celtic and Rangers, I'm just glad I don't have to ask them what school they went to because it's been confirmed to me. Um, I th- thought it was strange when I heard it in Marty's press conference, um, I must admit. Uh, yeah, but definitely for me, Celtic and Rangers means that you favour Celtic first. It's- probably a bit petty but that's just how it works yeah me too I mean I've denied people jobs based on that frankly uh, over the years Uh, I'm just kidding just before anybody says uh, and I get in trouble I'd already rooted them out at the CV stage uh, by their name so uh, I'm going to go for 2-1 I said Adam is going for for 3-1 now, we hope that uh, our team is, is successful on Saturday, but we'll be back after it on Heart and Hand, the Patreon site, with our immediate post-match reaction. Uh, if you want to, and Adam will be back uh, next week with his tactics show where he'll break down the game, what happened. Uh, if you're into the tactics side of thing, and as you can tell, listening to him, um, he very much is, uh, <laughs> that you uh, will we'll get that on our Patreon site. There's loads and loads and loads of content on there. There's at least three shows per day. And uh, it's one ninety nine per month to just go to patreon.com forward slash heart and hand. If, however, you're happy enough just to continue to watch us, uh, or listen to us rather, watching us would be appalling, no one wants that, uh, then we'll be back on Monday with the next episode of the flagship Heart and Hand show. So that's pretty much it for me today. All that remains for me to do is to thank our executive producers in London, Mr. Mike Lee and Mr. Paul Myers, to thank our sponsors, Maitland & Co., And just remind you that you can go and see all the services that they offer at their website, maitlandandco.net. That's maitlandandco.net. Adam, thank you very much for joining me. No worries. Always a pleasure. And to everyone else, enjoy Saturday and we'll be back here on Monday. Thank you. Bye. (laughs) 